All right, lovely. Well, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate uh, being uh, given the opportunity to have a chat about Marxist capitalism today. And I think it's a particularly uh, important time, really. And, and, and most people are kind of disenfranchised by what's going on in the world. Um, and I think we need a, a, a new way of creating value. Uh, if you listen to George Monbiot talking about GDP being an absolute waste of time and quite actually just planet destroying, is he's absolutely right. And we need to look at new ways of creating value um, in the society that we live to deliver the services that we want to help the least well off in society and wider society. Um, and so uh, I'd worked uh, with Zoe, who's on, on this call, in a, a very uh, large company, and I'd, I was just staggered at how myopic uh, the management was. I, <clears throat> back in 1993, uh, was taken out to Japan. It was, they had an incentive scheme that if you're the best salesperson in this group, and this group was 5,000 people strong, and it was half a billion turnover, big printing company. Um, you you took your customer out to Japan and I went to Kyoto uh, to NEC, Nippon Electric Company, which at the time was a huge, huge electronics company. And I saw what was effectively back in 1993, before the Internet, uh, a Kindle. They called it the NEC digital paperback. But this is where it showed digital content for the first time I'd ever seen it. And the actual you know, pages moving around. And I was like blown away by this. It's absolutely staggering. And I went back, I flew back early from that trip to go back to say to the, to the group, guys, we've got to get into this because they were all guys, of course. Um, they, they, we, we've got to get into this. And after 18 months of trying to persuade them to go into new media, and we had all of the customers, we were printing TV times, radio times, we were doing Argos catalogs and boots catalogs and all, all that. They said, no, no, we'll stick with the knitting. We know what it is. And I just thought this is madness. And the way that they treated people was... You, you call it disrespectful now they don't care about the individual they don't and so when i set webmart up in 1996 i thought well, i've got to leave i've got to leave and it was really easy to see what i needed to do to create a business um because all i had to do was the diametric opposite of every company that i'd worked for so <laughs> instead of focusing on the, the money the money generation uh you focus on the people that create the money so you, my my ethos was really quite simple. Wrap everything around the people that you've got within your organization, understand them best. And then as a consequence of that, you get the best out of them. You aggregate together under a strategy and a, and a purpose. Um, and that aligns people to that. And as long as it's not about the person at the top getting all the money and you give the people the opportunity to uh, benefit from the success of the business in a very real way every year, then it should work. And so I, I started um, by looking at the, the kind of three drivers, if you like, if you know, looking at my, my personal journey, if you like, I'd, I'd always wanted to be the best I could be. Um, and so those that means that you, in this order, you look at the intellectual value the emotional value and the financial value of what you can deliver to the people who work in your organization and the people you work for as an organization. So intellectually, I want to understand the psyche of the person. So there's a, you, you can look into yeah, things like obviously psychometric tests, but, uh, and, and you look into things like Enneagrams about the group dynamics and whatever, to understand the person and where their comparative advantage is. And if you've ever get a chance, bless him, uh, to have a look at Ken Robinson's TED talk, I think, which is one of the most watched ever TED talks, um, it kind of brings you to uh, actually realise that the role that you're doing may not be the great, the best role for you. He taught, he's an educationalist and he was talking about kids that don't hit mainstream educational attainment but but have got other skills and stuff and it, it's that kind of approach of looking intellectually how do you give the person the best role so you pivot the roles around the person rather than trying to shoehorn the person into a role that you have to 
to deliver. Once you've done that, and that will evolve over time, you have to constantly review people's life changes and that, you know, and as you give them a broader spectrum of things that they experience, they can go certain ways. Uh, uh, so you have to keep doing that on an ongoing basis. If you give people the chance to be intellectually uh, sated, guess what? They enjoy it because generally, if you've got a, if, if you hit your sweet spot intellectually, you do work that you're good at and as a consequence of that, you enjoy it. And if you've got people that uh, are in that, that sweet spot, then you're maximizing their emotional return. And if you've got people who are doing a good job and are clearly enjoying it, people want to trade with you. People want to work with you. People will refer you on. People will give you more work. And as a consequence, as an output of that, you have the financial return as a business. And as long as you are you use the uh, have a clarity of strategy which is meaningful not some kind of mission statement that's abstracted from their their everyday existence so what is the purpose or work that you're doing to put your intellect to enjoy what you're doing and to get a full return on your la uh, your labor employed then actually why would you want to go anywhere else and so the the, I, the ethos of it was that I look at, at the bag of people that I've got because the business is only it's a bag of people and the bag that they're in is the strategy. And if they get it and they want to be part of it, then aggregating and aligning those people to deliver an exceptional return is actually relatively easy. And most of the kind of challenges, the stresses that we find in leadership tend to fall away um, when you've got that alignment of purpose and you've got people that are making the most of their every day uh, in your organization and can see a progression. That progression may not be hierarchical always in terms of you know more senior positions because there's only so many uh, senior positions, but if you're challenging and giving them the opportunity on a lateral way to be specialists in an area or generalists and broadening out their experience, then people are feeling and are getting more progression. And you, it gives you the opportunity to bring in new product lines and services and then have specialists in those and champions of those. And it gives them a, a, an opportunity to to um, to thrive in that environment. Now, in terms of the kind of business structure, if you like, what I what I did was I um, uh, I didn't go through this kind of give people shares and all this kind of stuff, because what you tend to find is that those that are in first get most. And it isn't meritocratic. So you can have people that, that uh, happened through happy coincidence to be one of the earliest in there. All of a sudden, you know, they're not pulling the weight or they've not they've not delivered what they should be doing. And you, you're stymied with that. So I've got one share in Webmark, which is in a trust, which can't be sold. Um, so that takes that whole kind of issue uh, um, of ownership out of it. Um, I also committed I would never borrow money and the company that I'd been in before would been leveraged heavily and you ended up being the financial tail wagging the dog and as a consequence of that it, 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 you have to do all sorts of strange convoluted things which don't mean anything to anybody who's working there so I've always been self-funded so if we can't if we couldn't afford it we didn't do it but we retained the profit so I got a structure in place where we retained a certain amount of profits and this is the marxist bit we we want to have the wherewithal to deliver an exceptional business to people who are working within it and the people who work alongside it our clients and our suppliers so you need to have that cash to be able to test things to try things to fail to be able to be innovative and creative but with all of those things, there's a high degree of uncertainty. So, but if it's your money, then you can try it and you're not going to get anybody stopping you or anybody telling you you can't give it a go because it's stupid. Um, and that, so what we have is what we call the sexy scheme. And this is the Marxist redistribution of it. And the sexy stands for senior executive incentive scheme. Uh, everybody who's been there for two years is a senior executive, no matter what their role is. Um, and we had, for the first two years, we made £400,000 profit. So we've capped it at that. So the retained profit in our business is £400,000 a year. And that allows us to have the freedom to be able to do the right thing 
to do the creative things, to do the innovative things that may or may not work out, that may or may not allow us to move forward. Um, above that, that surplus profits, and that needs to go back to the people that make it. And what we've uh, have as a redistribution of that, everybody who's been in there for two years is a pot of base salary effectively. We don't incentivize the incentives. So if you have an incentive like the commission scheme or whatever, that's excluded from it. But the base salary, which is marked to the marketplace on a regular basis, um, is put into a bag. And then the profits over and above £400,000 are shared out. And that is up to a million pounds. Half of it goes to the team, half of it goes to me. Above a million pounds profit, it all goes to the business, to the individuals within it, not me. So it gives an uh, unended uh, opportunity for people to get a significant return on their labor employed um, by being loyal, creative members of our team. And this is where the Marxist redistribution of the wealth created allows people to have an exceptional standard of living uh, and an ex exceptional quality of life because they feel that they are part of the business because they are the business and they are giving entrepreneurs return for being part of that business. Um, it depend, but our success is dependent on the commercial success of the business. So capitalism is important, but we take into account the externalities, as an economist will call it, um, which are things like sustainability is hugely important. Things like um, looking after the least well off in society is incredibly important because we put all of the bonuses through payroll. Um, we pay the highest marginal rate of tax that we can, that we should do. Um, so we give the HMRC a significant amount more than the average employer does per person. So society is well looked after. But it also gives us cash. And uh, the business is cash generative. You've got no debts and you, you are profitable every year, which we have been. Um, it gives us the freedom to do things. And then you look at the cash that you've got. What can you do with that cash to deliver an exceptional intellectual, emotional, and ultimately financial return as well from the cash you've got on the balance sheet? So one thing that we did do um, was about eight years ago now is bought the what we call the Webmar Oxygen Farm. And this is a rewilding project that we've created in a place called Coldingham in the borders um, and this is 164 acres of uh, land that we have now planted 13,000 trees in uh, we've made 27 ponds we've got a award-winning eco lodge on there and the uh, the idea of that is to turn cash into an asset which adds value to everybody and to the, to the planet so we simply bought this land we have rewilded it we've invested 400,000 pounds in that um and everybody in the business gets a free week in the lodge and this is one of those beautiful kind of dark sky areas that you right near the coast that you can actually actually surround it's got everything you could want except one thing which is the internet <laughs> and that allows people to and families which are particularly with, with teenage children or young children who are glued to screens quite a lot now they have to be present and so this gives them an opportunity for free to go out into this wonderful um, part of, of the world to understand about the biodiversity element of it, as well as carbon sequestration. You know, it allows them to be part of, of this and uh, build, you know, uh, places in woodlands and, uh, and go and see the fauna and flora. We've got uh, a forester called Colin. We've got a, a naturalist called Willow. And we've even got a man called Attila who's looking after our fungi. Uh, <laughs> there's mapping all of the stuff there, which is part of the, as we enhance the biodiversity of that area, we've got a baseline assessment, and then we, we're going to look at the incremental value that it delivers to wildlife as well. So this is where you've turned cash on your balance sheet into an asset. 
which obviously we'll appreciate over time and it has done quite significantly um uh, but also enhances everybody's lives and the reason i wanted it in scotland in that area of scotland is, is two things one is that scotland has a wonderfully enlightened uh, principle of right to roam so everybody in the local environment can go into it and, and uh, see it and in september we're having a uh, barbecue up there for all of the locals and the team to sit down to give us, uh, if you like, a state of the nation uh, speech about the rewilding project that we've got. It's a 200 year plan we have here. Oh, we want okay. to recreate a Caledonian forest. So we work really closely with Scottish forestry. Um, we've got a, a 20 year plan of uh, custodianship of it, but the vision is for 200 years um to make this one of the preeminent uh places in scotland that people can go and visit and see that baseline we, you know in oxford you've got Whit witton woods which is or whiter Wood, which has been obviously tracked from you know 1760 or something it's the most um i think it's the most scientifically studied uh, forest in the world um we want to do a similar kind of thing but starting from a different baseline up in scotland we want to enhance everybody's life in the local area and include them in that, but also have that data-driven approach to how we how you can uh, achieve biodiversity and carbon sequestration, which is one of the kind of uh, the kind of key things that obviously we need to do um, uh, as a planet to be commercially successful, but also enhance the environment rather than degrade it. Um, so that that's where, the, if you like, the start of the sustainable. Before that, we 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 obviously uh, sequestered and we bought in, but now we've actually got our own place to do it. Um, I've got some land up here that I've just planted seven hundred trees in, um, and a part of what we're trying to do is not only be a good commercially successful organisation, not just be an ethical business that, that uh, looks after its people very well and delivers an exceptional lifestyle and career path for people and delivers to our customers an exceptional and differentiated product and our suppliers as well who are a key part of this but we also want to offer thought leadership and and practical examples and share that uh the, the lessons that we learned the things that work the things that haven't worked to deliver an a, a, a thought leadership piece we're a 27 year old case study of doing things differently and it kind of shows that you can be successful in the conventional sense but also do it in a very unconventional way and that that gives people heart to realize that there are many ways to being successful you don't have to be like the apprentice and have these people who dog eat dog and all this kind of stuff to to get on you can actually be true to your your core values and actually make a difference in the world at the same time as being successful the, the other area that we've always been very clear about is that we have a duty of care to the least wealth in society and because we've accrued value over the time um in that you know we've got millions of pounds in the bank we, we get interest on that well we don't actually do anything for that we don't we haven't worked hard for it it's just mm. sitting there so we give all of the interest that we get on those cash balances to charity um and it's now just gone over seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds worth of, of charitable donations and we also have some spare office space we bought our office space and we we rent that out and half of the of the uh rental income we get go into a charity pot and then that pot i think that last year uh, our year end uh march of this year last financial year was about seventy thousand pounds so the interest rates have gone up it allows us to do more good uh, and everybody in the organization gets a thousand pounds to give to their favorite charity and some time to work in it and two things that that delivers is one it, it helps and it actually makes them appreciate um a thousand pounds in the scheme of things you don't think well it can make a difference but actually a lot of these relatively small charities it really does make a difference so they can see the impact that you get so we're making a difference in society but also to the individual it makes them it's a leveler you know we it's an e easy for us to think you know we have a degree of entitlement that we have a due you know we're always going to be successful or we're always going to be lucky actually 
seeing some of the you know a couple of wrong decisions in your life and quite often you can be homeless or you can have you know if you weren't lucky enough to be brought up in a caring and nurturing environment or you happen to have the wrong uh you know experiences in life you, you know it does cast a pall all the way through so i think it, it helps to keep it real for people who are achieving well and doing a good job to, to never forget that um actually there are a lot worse off people in society than yourself not through any fault of their own often um and it's one of those things that allows people to actually really just uh, appreciate they are part of a wider society they are part uh, and, and we have a uh, i think a duty of care to support as many people as we possibly can and this is a way a sustainable way of us being able to fund uh, a range of charitable um uh roles in in whatever it is that you're you're passionate about so it adds value to the individual as well as the you know maybe tiggy winkles animal rescue it may be you know mcmillan it may be you know homeless charity center point or whatever whatever's meaningful to them it allows them to go and see it so the idea is instead of being a capitalist company that is there to maximize the financial return for the shareholders or even the stakeholders you look more holistically at the uh, role that you have a business is whatever you want to make of it and you can it can live by your value set you don't have to listen to the accountants you don't have to listen to the lawyers you don't have to listen to the bankers they're in their world because they've gone through professional qualifications there is only one way to do things and obviously for compliance and legal reasons I you, you totally understand that but to create value you've got a much wider scope of opportunities to do it that aligns with your personal uh, objectives your personal desires and, and and passions than the conventional way that you read in textbooks and Marxist capitalism is just one flavor of the different ways you can run a business sustainably for the planet for the individuals within it and as an organization to be profitable in the long term and you know that in, in synopsis is the approach that we've taken and we will do going forward you know it allowed us to be deliver the world's first online estimating engine for printing in 2000 uh, it has allowed us to flex and use artificial intelligence already in part of what we're doing in our uh, software development team and what have you so it, far from it being something that is precious in one sense that it is static and it works you've got to constantly evolve and what you tend to find is if there is an alignment to the individual in in a very real sense they understand you need to invest for the future you know it may take a short-term hit but the long-term benefit is it, it future proofs you and if you look at the marketplace that we started in which is printing um and the evisceration that it's had to be somewhere in the region of 20 percent of the companies that were when i started out there still left now um yet we've managed through evolving an evolutionary nature of it to come to the position that we are now and where we're going to go which will be on a you know in a three-year plan in a global uh, business offering embedded within our software the sustainability um and the business model that we have so others can can share it and and be part of it and i think the uh, the whole person approach that uh young people want the talent that you want to attract uh is really appealing um and yes we are a b corp but as the guy who brought b corp into the uk said to me he said sound you're a b corp well before b corps are b corps you know it it's the ethos that you've got in your head about looking after that balance between profitability personal and planet and and uh, delivering those three those three things together allows you to actually sleep well at night be successful but also it allows people to thrive and be the best that they can be and that in synopsis of what we try and do at webmark and i think that's me 18 minutes could be saved.